Greetings, Earthlings, and welcome to another episode of Ask an Astrobiologist. This is the show where we celebrate science and celebrate scientists, specifically involved in astrobiology. This quest that we have to better understand our place in the cosmos really involves all of us. Uh, and so we're here as a platform for all of you, for all of us to have a voice to ask the important questions of ourselves and of each other. Uh, specifically, we're here to ask our great scientists in astrobiology about their careers, their research, and the things that drive them forward. Uh, this show is produced by the NASA Astrobiology Program and Seganet.org. Now, before we get to today's episode, which I'm really excited about, uh, we're going to start off with our background quiz. So our return audience knows that every month there's a new background behind myself or my co-host Sanjoy Sam. And every month we ask you what these pictures show with a chance to win some prizes. So last month's picture was kind of this weird, gunky looking, nasty glob of orangish, reddish stuff. Uh, that was actually a microbial mat from Grand Prismatic Spring in Yellowstone National Park in Wyoming. Grand Prismatic is the third largest hot spring in the world. And in the center of this spring are this really beautiful, deep ultramarine blue color. Uh, and you see the steam kind of boiling off, but out around the edges of this hot spring, you see the colors of the rainbow, oranges and yellows and greens and reds, kind of all mixed together on the outer edges that are caused by microbes living in these microbial mats. Uh, specifically, the colors you see, the greens are coming primarily from chlorophyll, and then the reds and oranges are coming from carotenoid pigments inside of these microbes. Uh, one really cool thing about Grand Prismatic is that in the summertime, you tend to see more of the reds and the oranges, and in the wintertime, when it's a little bit cooler, around the edges of the spring, you see more of the green from the chlorophyll. And so Grand Prismatic is, is beautiful and colored, but the color also varies throughout the year. Now, for our background quiz, we always give out prizes. Uh, we have a bunch of people always answer and get it right. And so now we take that pool of right answers and pick out a few winners. Uh, our third place winners will get some of our very cool NASA stickers. Our second place winners get some of those stickers plus some of our awesome graphic histories of NASA astrobiology. And then our first place winners get both of those as well as a segnet.org drinking glass. Uh, and so for this past month's winners, uh, we have in third place was Gustavo Delaval. In second place was Bushra Chalik Bosch. And in first place was Anna. And so congratulations to all of you on winning our awards for our background quiz from this past month. Uh, hopefully I pronounced your names right, specifically Bushra. Uh, I did look up how to pronounce your name in Turkish. So if I pronounced it wrong, I apologize. I do try my best. Uh, so for next month, pay attention to what I have here behind me and we'll do yet another background quiz. Uh, so with that said, I'm very excited to introduce you to today's special guest, Dr. Jason Wright of Penn State University. Uh, Dr. Wright, hello, and welcome to Ask an Astrobiologist. Hello, glad to be here. Yeah, it's, it's great to have you. Um, before we get anywhere in discussing uh, your awesome work and things you've done, uh, like five minutes before we started the episode, I saw on Twitter that you were just announced as the recipient of the 2019 Drake Award from the SETI Institute. Congratulations on that. Thank you. Yeah, it's uh, it's uh, quite an honor to, uh, to be announced for that award. I'm really looking forward to the to the ceremony in May down in uh, uh, down there in the San Francisco Bay Area. Yeah, it's wonderful. Yeah, I, I'm actually hoping I can be there. We'll see uh, if it's possible with my travel schedule. Um, so let's get talking then about your research, since it involves some SETI, but it also involves a lot of things in understanding stars and exoplanets. You've been involved in, in instrument development and, and utilization, uh, and you've also worked with lots of teams of, of graduate students, undergraduate students. So uh, I'm really excited to hear about this. Uh, before we get into it, though, I'd, I'd love for you just to give our audience a little bit of a background about yourself. Uh, what inspired you to get started in science and what kind of brought you to where you are now? Well, um, I wish I remembered. I've, I've wanted to be an astronomer uh, as long as I can remember. When I was just a little kid looking at books about space, I thought that's, that's what I want to do. That's what I want to be. And I was really fortunate that, uh, that the job turned out to be something that I really enjoy doing something I'm good at. 
Uh, a lot of times, you know, we imagine we're going to be something, you know, like a space firefighter or something, and that just turns out not to be practical. Uh, but I, I was lucky enough that it's something that I've enjoyed every step of the way. Uh, so I've just followed that through my whole schooling from uh, being an astronomy and physics major at Boston University, getting into UC Berkeley for graduate studies in astronomy and astrophysics, uh, and now as an associate professor here at Penn State University, where I've, I'm in my 10th year now, um, doing the things that my, my mentors uh, did for me, advising groups of students, um, coming up with new research projects, fun things to work on that matter, uh, and uh, just finding lots of fun problems to work on. One of the things I love about this field is that uh, there are more problems than there are astronomers. That is, there are more interesting things to work on than people that can work on them. Which means that while there are a lot of really big problems that require huge teams of people to all solve that one problem, there's also lots of little problems that you can kind of have all to yourself uh, that are really interesting to work on, and you can just have going on, you know, on the side as you as you learn more and think more about it. And so, for my career, since I've been a graduate student, most of the bread and butter research in teams and groups has been finding new exoplanets, these planets orbiting other stars. So when I started, there were between 20 and 30 exoplanets known. And now we have over 100, time, or, yeah, over 100 times that, which is just amazing to have watched the field explode. Um, and, uh, but then I've also worked on problems that are a bit less flashy, you know, understanding how some like stars work uh, has always been something that I've worked on. It's my very first research project. And then even more out there, little hobby projects uh, involving search for extraterrestrial intelligence, which is something I started working on just a few years ago, actually. And it's been a lot of fun. Oh, that's wonderful. Yeah, so I, I want to talk first, then, I guess, about some of your work in looking at exoplanets. Um, you know, like you said, like a 100 time increase since when you first started looking, uh, sometimes I'm, I'm blown away by when, when I see children these days who, who've grown up in an era where we know of thousands of exoplanets. When I was a kid, that wasn't the case. Right. And it makes me wonder for like the next generations, how many tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands uh, we'll actually know of. Uh, so, for instance, I, I saw on your website that you're involved in two different instruments that are kind of you know, up and coming right now on telescopes uh, to look for exoplanets around other stars. Uh, one of those is NUID, and the other one is the Hubble Zone Planet Finder. Um, I'm wondering if you could speak to us a bit about those instruments uh, and what they're going to show us about exoplanets. Sure. Um, so uh, these are both instruments that were conceived of, um, designed, and mostly built uh, here at Penn State University. Um, the first is the Habitable Zone Planet Finder, or HPF, as we call it. Um, it's a stable spectrograph. So it uh, takes starlight from a telescope and it spreads it out into all the colors of the rainbows so that we can see uh, the, the fingerprints of the chemical elements in stars' atmospheres. And then it's stable, which means that the wavelengths that we measure those fingerprints at are known extremely well. And if we come back months or years later and measure them again, we know exactly how much they've shifted. And uh, we, with this spectrograph, we can watch as stars seem to move back and forth or do move back and forth uh, because of planets orbiting them. So this was the original method by which planets around other sun-like stars uh, were first discovered with 51 Pegasi and the ones that followed for many years. Um, and it's, uh, it's how we indirectly infer the presence of these planets, but we know all sorts of things about the planets we discover that way. We know their orbital periods, their approximate temperatures, and we have a pretty good handle on their masses when we discover them that way. So the Habitable Zone Planet Finder is uh, special in a couple of ways. One is that it's on the, uh, the nine meter Hobby Everly Telescope in Texas. So it gets to collect a lot of light and we can study very faint stars with it. Another is that it works at infrared wavelengths uh, or maybe infrared astronomers might call it the near optical. It's kind of right, right redder than you can see with the eye, but not quite at the infrared level that infrared astronomers talk about sometimes. Um, and the advantage there is that we can look at the very coolest stars. Most of the stars in the galaxy are actually far too faint to see. In fact, the very closest stars to Earth, like Proxima Centauri or Barnard Star, 
are invisible to the eye. They're just far too faint at optical wavelengths. So it's hard to look for planets around them. But uh, if we move into the infrared, they're much brighter there because they're cool and that's where they give off most of their light. Uh, so with this instrument, we can look around the most abundant kinds of stars in the galaxy. Uh, these are also the closest stars to Earth. And the reason it's called the Habitable Zone Planet Finder is that uh, the, the region around those stars where planets might have liquid water is very close to the star, which means that they pull on the star really hard and they go around really fast, which means that the signal that we see from the star going back and forth is pretty strong, which means with that instrument, we can actually detect uh, presumably terrestrial rocky planets at the right temperature for liquid water around the very nearest stars. And we can only do that because we have this giant telescope and we're in the near infrared. So that's on the telescope now. And in fact, every week we see the new velocities that are coming in and, and get excited about the new planets that we're just starting to discover with that instrument. So that's, that's great. Um, the second uh, spectrograph that we're building is one that's still in progress. It's in the lab right now, uh, undergoing... Um, um, uh, well, we're working on it and putting it all together and testing things out and, and, and finding bugs and fixing them. Uh, this was a spectrograph that was commissioned by NASA and the National Science Foundation as a national premier facility for finding planets around other stars. So it will go on the WIND 3.5 meter telescope at Kitt Peak National Observatory. Uh, and it will be available for the entire world to propose for and to use. In fact, the call for proposals for the first people to use it for the first time, uh, those proposals are due at the end of this month. So we're all rapidly writing proposals trying to put those together to use this thing. So its claim to fame is that it will be uh, exquisitely stable. It, 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 the amount of... Um, uh, the amount of instrumental noise that it will contribute to our instruments will be so low it'll actually be hard to detect for most stars. And in terms of the velocities we measure, it'll be of order 30 centimeters per second. So to give you a sense, um, when a planet wiggles a star around, like when Jupiter wiggles the sun around as it goes around, every 12 years the sun goes from moving in one direction at about 12 meters per second, so it's a little faster than the fastest human sprinters, and then six years later, it'll be going away in the other direction at 12 meters per second. The Earth around the sun makes the sun go back and forth every year at about 10 centimeters per second. And the instrumental stability of this instrument will be around three times that, 30 centimeters a second. So the instrument will not be limiting us from detecting things maybe three times the mass of the Earth or around the mass of the Earth in the habitable zone around a star a little less massive than the sun. Uh, now, there's a lot of other issues with measuring the velocities of stars to that precision, but uh, that this instrument uh, will at least be able to um, allow us to tackle that problem of measuring those velocities. That's incredible. Uh, so if you had to guess, how many Earth-like or Earth-sized, roughly Earth-sized planets do you think that we'll be finding in just the next few years using just these instruments? Oh, with precise radio velocities, yeah. Well, we'll be limited just by how many stars we can point at, basically. Um, what we've discovered with Kepler and other, and other surveys is that most stars have planets. Uh, we didn't, you know, we didn't know this before Kepler. We knew that there were giant planets around lots of stars, and we would typically point in maybe one in ten stars that we pointed at, we'd find planets. And then as we started getting much more precise with instruments like the predecessors to HPF and NUID, um, we started finding that that number was much higher, maybe 50% or something like that. But it was hard to tell because, you know, measuring these things is very difficult. Uh, and then when Kepler launched and just discovered how many small planets that we had been insensitive to with the radial velocity technique were really out there, we started running the numbers. And like the, the typical number of planets per star is more than one. And so um, with these, this next generation of instruments, we can expect that almost every star we point at has planets. The question will just be, can we make enough measurements and are we sensitive enough to count them? Wow, that's incredible. Uh, real quick, I want to remind our audience that you can ask questions for Dr. Wright on segannet.org, uh, on the NASA Astrobiology Facebook page, and on Twitter using the hashtag AskAstroBio. Uh, so it's pretty incredible now. We have things like HPF and NUID coming out uh, for ground-based observations. You mentioned Kepler. Um, we now have TESS, the Transiting Exoplanet Survey Satellite, which you know, many of us are looking forward to the possible thousands of planets we'll find with TESS. Um, I'm wondering, what, what do you think the future now holds for exoplanet discovery? 
um, for these next generation telescopes that have been proposed like Lavoir and JWST and some of these other instruments that are going to be out there uh, in space and on the ground. Uh, do you think, uh, say, but maybe in the next 10 years that we'll have another 10,000 exoplanets that we'll know of, or is that a little too optimistic? Um, so, you know, when we started this, every planet was New York Times headline. Every planet, every system was new and strange and interesting and different. Um, and then once we started getting past about 100, just, you know, one more exoplanet wasn't necessarily something groundbreaking. Um and then uh, when we started finding planets transiting other stars, passing between us and the star and making the star get dimmer, that opened up the possibility for something like Kepler, where we might find thousands of them. Um, and so with Kepler, that's happened. We have thousands of planets from Kepler, and we're going to get thousands more from TESS. And so that's allowing us to do the statistics, mostly of shorter period planets. So most of those planets we're talking about orbit their stars in less than a year. Many of them orbit their stars in less than 30 days, um, which is much closer to their stars than anything in our solar system orbits the sun. Um, so we have the, the statistics for these very close in planets pretty well nailed. Um, and so I don't think there's, that there's going to be an opportunity to get another like 10,000 of those because that by itself probably isn't a sufficiently compelling science problem to launch a whole new mission. Um, so, uh, so especially with tests now that we're going to have something like 10,000 planets when we're all done with that and all the Kepler data, um, the question is, you know, what do we do next? And what we do next is we study the most interesting planets and get to know them better. So what are some of the most interesting planets? We'd like to find things like the Earth. That ties in closest to the search for life in the universe. Because while, of course, nature could surprise us and life could be anywhere and something we weren't expecting, if we're going to go looking for it, we have to have some sense of where to look. And so the best bet that we have when we go looking are places like Earth and places that life we know can form on Earth. So we'd like to find rocky planets around one Earth mass. We'd like those planets to have something like the, the, the surface temperatures where we'd expect liquid water to be. So uh, we're going to go looking for those, and we don't know about very many of those planets. That's what HPF is for. That's what NUIT is for. And uh, we, uh, so hopefully we will be getting up to dozens and dozens of those in the future. Um, we also have the opportunity with these new space coronagraphs to actually directly image older planets, maybe in reflected light, and study what they're like. Um, and so many of those will be giant planets, more like Jupiter. Some of them will be smaller. Um, and that'll be exciting to actually see that dot of light in an image and actually be able to get a spectrum of it and learn something about its atmosphere. The other thing we can do is look for planets that we know pass in front of their star from our vantage point, transiting planets that are like Earth, hopefully, and study their atmosphere and transmission. That is, we won't get a picture of that planet uh, that we can look at, but we will watch the star get dimmer, and some of that light being blocked by the star is passing through the planet's atmosphere. And so we can study the spectrum of the light as it gets passed through the atmosphere and study the atmospheric composition of those planets. So with the James Webb Space Telescope, we're hopeful that we'll be able to measure actual planetary atmosphere constituents, not just of very hot or giant planets like Jupiter or even bigger than Jupiter, but hopefully of much smaller things, uh, hopefully even things that might be rocky and have atmospheres like the Earth. Oh, that's so cool. Yeah, I think a lot of us in the astrobiology community and enthusiasts of astrobiology are hopeful for one of those days when we find one of these atmospheres that could have the signs of life inside of it. Um, yeah. if, we, if we found that, um, do you think that would really change our search for, for uh, extraterrestrial life? Do you think we'd start honing in then on one of those worlds where we find potential biosignatures in an atmosphere and really try to figure out um, if it is life or not? Yeah, certainly. If we saw something that was really indicative of life, I think that that target would get a lot of observations. We would we would, we would pour a lot into that particular target. Um, and uh, and yeah, I mean, one issue is that when we first find biosignatures, they probably will be a bit ambiguous. Um, people are always thinking of new ways that we might say, "Hey, that's that's a biosignature." We see, for instance, methane and oxygen in the same planetary atmosphere, and on Earth. That only happens because of, of life. 
Um, but then we'll always be able to dream up, not always, we will often be able to dream up abiotic ways to produce that particular signature. And these are going to be very challenging detections. The first time we detect it, it'll be low signal to noise, the data will be ratty, it'll be a little ambiguous, but it'll be intriguing enough that we'll try harder to make a better measurement and really understand what we're looking at. And so depending on what we find, depending on what it was that intrigued us, That'll, you know, dictate how we follow up on those instruments. And it might be a long time before everybody concurs, yeah, you know, that's life on another planet. Um, um, so it's hard to say how long it'll take. Um, remember when 51 Pegasi, the first planet around a sun-like star, was discovered, in retrospect, that was a watershed moment. And certainly there was a lot of excitement when that was announced. But it wasn't universally accepted that that was an exoplanet. It was such a surprising discovery. It was not what we thought we would see. And so it took a few years for things to shake out and everyone to agree, yeah, you know, the exoplanet revolution has actually begun. And I suspect that's what it will be with biosignatures too. You know, 20 years after the first one is detected, that'll go down as the watershed moment. But actually that following five or 10 years, there will be a lot of discussion. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's incredible. I, I really hope so. And it'd be nice if that happens kind of soon so that some of us can see it. Um, see it play out, that's right. Absolutely, yeah. I do want to mention uh, that you maintain the website exoplanets.org, um, which is one great place for people to go and see the exoplanets we've discovered so far and learn more about them. Um, so how many exoplanets do we actually have right now in that database? Oh, the actual number. Uh, I'm going to have to actually cheat and, and, and jump over to see <laughs> the number. Okay. Um, so uh, we've kept track of 3,237 planets that have good orbits listed wow. in the database. And there are another um, uh, 26 that, uh, have, that we're pretty sure are real planets. They've been imaged or we saw them through microlensing where we don't have great orbits, but we know they're planets. And another 2,485 uh, candidate planets, most of which are real, uh, that were discovered by Kepler. And that's, that's where the database lives uh, today. And that's not even counting the planets that were published in the last, say, nine months. Wow. Um, so it was about it's about nine months behind that particular mm -hmm. database. But that's something that I've been maintaining since I was a graduate student. I said when I started, there were 20 or 30 planets. Uh, and I know because we kept a list. Paul Butler had his list of, of planets as they got discovered. And that list just grew and grew and grew. And eventually we put it on a computer and uh, eventually it became exoplanets.org. Uh, and so it's been a labor of love to keep track of all the planets coming out. And uh, that website has a great interface if you'd like to explore the planetary properties where you can make charts and graphs and see, see what kind of planets uh, uh, we know about or knew about it you know, almost a year ago. Truth be told, the, the, the flood is just too much. I can't actually keep up with all of the planets anymore. Uh, and that's why we're behind on that particular site. But it's still a great place to, to find about all of the exoplanets we know. Mm, well, that's incredible. Um, I guess it's you know both a good thing and a bad thing that it's a flood of exoplanets that we just can't keep up with. That's right. um, hopefully, we can you know have some undergrads and grad students come in and start taking over some of that work then too. Um, so I think yeah, we have a lot of plans to to port things over. We are uh, we're working with the folks at Space Telescope Science Institute mm -hmm. uh, and their their archive to integrate the data there into a lot of their data products, and we're hoping that we can uh, we, we can do more to keep it maintained uh, into the future, and that uh, we can even expand it to include potentially other databases as well, so that if you study asteroids or binary stars or something, you could have your own version of the interface. Oh, that's really cool. Yeah, I mean, like right now, we have spacecraft at two different asteroids in our solar system, like Bennu and Ryugu, and so it's pretty cool what's going on in solar system exploration right now as well. That's right. Um, to better understand the worlds of our solar system. Um, I do want to switch gears and mention that you are a project scientist with Nexus. Um, I'm wondering if you can mention, or your PI, sorry, um, with yeah. Nexus. I'm wondering if you can mention what your role is in Nexus uh, with NASA. So Nexus is interesting. It's, it's this research collaboration network where NASA picked people that were working on interesting projects with NASA grants. Uh, across a range of disciplines that relate to exoplanets. And we get together uh, in face-to-face -face meetings uh, about once a year or a little less, and, uh, and we just talk about how we can cross-pollinate each other's research. So we have people that think about heliophysics, people who think about geophysics, planetary science, 
uh, stellar astrophysics and ex exoplanets, and just trying to think of of um, uh, planetary systems uh, in terms of all of these things. Because you know, when we study, when we go looking for exoplanets, we're really staring at stars. Stars give us all the light. Uh, exoplanets give very little light compared to the star. And in some cases, you know, uh, we're not studying any planetary light at all. Uh, and so we have to understand the stars super well to find the planets. And then we want to know what the planets are like. So we need to understand the stars again. How are they uh, illuminating their planets and what's that like? And then we want to know what the planets are made of. And we know they're made of the same stuff as the stars. So now, again, we're studying the star to learn about the planet. Um, and, of course, we have a star in our backyard, this sun hanging out there that we know extremely well. And yet there's not a lot of discussion among heliophysicists who know that star really well and exoplanetary astronomers who are trying to stand their, their planets really well. Uh, and then we discover things that we think are rocky and we're trying to discover what a rocky exoplanet might be like. But what do you know? We've got these geophysicists who know this rocky planet we sit on really, really well. So it's a nexus for us all to learn what the other people know and what we're trying to figure out so we're not reinventing wheels. It's a really productive way to work, to go to these meetings and hear what people are working on and, and think about the big picture you might call planetary systems. Mm -hmm. That's wonderful. Yeah, having that kind of level of collaboration to bring people together from kind of different backgrounds to approach those problems together. Um, so do you, do you have uh, graduate students, undergraduate students working in your laboratory as well who are involved in some of this work that you've been doing, uh, looking at stars, looking at exoplanets, involved with Nexus and these various instruments? Absolutely. Yeah. So uh, in terms of Nexus, one of the benefits of, of being a PI of Nexus is that we can um, ask NASA to sponsor postdoctoral fellows. And so uh, the, the catch is that it has to be two Nexus PIs that work on different things that co-advise a uh, postdoctoral scholar to attack a problem, you know, from both angles at once. So we work, uh, so our postdoctoral scholar uh, that I work with is Eva Bodman at Arizona State University, uh, where her primary advisor is Steve Desch, another Nexus PI. And uh, Steve's group is really diverse. It's hard to contain exactly what he works on, but they think about planets and planetary atmospheres. They think about the solar system. Uh, and then I bring the stellar astrophysics angle, which is my primary background. And so Eva's worked on a bunch of interesting projects. She's studied the light curve of Tabby's star, uh, which is this star that Kepler discovered that has something blocking its light. It's very confusing, hard to understand exactly what's going on, uh, making the star get suddenly dimmer for like a week at a time. And uh, Eva working with uh, Tabby Boyajian at, at Louisiana State University and me and Steve has put together all the data we have on it and shown that whatever's blocking the starlight is dust. It's this astrophysical stuff that fills fills the galaxy and often orbits stars, although we don't know why it's around this star, and try to study its properties so we can figure out what's going on with that star. She's also looking at how we can study exoplanet interiors. Um, there are, there's a rare class of exoplanet discovered by Kepler that orbits its star uh, in less than a day. So these things are not far from their star at all, just a few stellar radii. And they can go around in like eight to 15 hours. Um, and when a planet is that close to a star, apparently it can evaporate or something's going on that they're losing a lot of material. So we can't actually see the planet block the starlight, but we do see this huge plume of material coming off of a planet blocking the starlight. Uh, and so she's been studying how we can use the James Webb Space Telescope to analyze the mineralogical properties of that material coming off of these exoplanets, which would actually allow us to understand the mineralogical properties of an exoplanet interior directly. We'll have a spectrum of the material of the inside of an exoplanet, which is extraordinary because we don't even have that for solar system planets. We really don't have that very well understood for the Earth itself. We have very few samples of the deep Earth interior, and we don't know how representative they are. So it's a pretty extraordinary opportunity to study what rocky exoplanets are made of. So that's, that's what she's working on with Steve, for instance. Yeah, that sounds incredible um, just to see inside of a planet like that. I know we've, we've I've heard people talk about Jupiter possibly having liquid and metallic hydrogen layers down inside of it, but we really don't know if it's there or not. And so it'd be so cool if we could see, you know, inside of a world like that to better understand it. Before we do open it up to audience questions, though, uh, Dr. Roy, uh, I want to chat a little bit about SETI um, and what you've done so far in your work with SETI. 
Um, and this quest to understand if there is extraterrestrial intelligence out there in the universe. Uh, would you mind speaking about what you've, what you've been involved with so far? Sure. So it's only been the last couple of years that I've been working on this. I kind of fell into it. Um, the search for extraterrestrial intelligence is, is really a broad field. Most people, when they, when they hear the term, they think about Jodie Foster on her car, the headphones, right? The very large array in the background. Um, and that is, I mean, except for the headphones, using, using radio telescopes to look for deliberate signals or even, or even leaked signals from uh, other civilizations uh, is is where a lot of the work in this field has happened. And indeed, if you were on a nearby star looking back at the sun and you wanted to know, is there life orbiting that star? The easiest way to tell that there was using Earth 2000 technology would be to listen for our radio transmissions. Things like radar uh, here on Earth is loud enough uh, strong enough signals that if you knew what you were looking for, you could in principle detect them at interstellar distances with modern Earth technology. So there's a strong argument that this is a really good way to go looking for not just life, but technological life, and that, that the signals that you might get from technological life might be much easier to detect and much more unambiguous than signs from uh, just biology or something like that. So we call these techno-signatures. Jill Tarter coined this term techno-signatures. It's a signature of technology, and technology presumably would therefore mean life. So in some sense, they're also a, a biosignature. But then um, there are a lot of other ideas for how you might go about finding life. They might send lasers instead of radio signals. And so there are um, a couple of nascent projects getting going to, to really do uh, large all-sky uh, surveys to look for laser signals instead of radio. Um, we'd also though, like to look for um, you know, any other sign, because we don't know how we're eventually going to succeed to find technological life in the universe. And there's a lot of potential signals that we might look for. And that's kind of where I live. Um, uh, I, I sometimes distinguish between communication city, where we're looking for deliberately communicative signals, and artifact city, where we look for um, the, the, the signs of technology that aren't necessarily designed to transmit or broadcast or get our attention. So just as one example, if you build something in space, it's generally going to need energy. And, uh, and if you're out floating around in space, what you'd like for energy is something like a fusion reactor that would just create huge amounts of energy for you. Um, and wonderfully, if you're out in space anywhere near a star, you've got one. You've got a gigantic fusion reactor sitting right there, steadily, stably for billions of years, just throwing energy at you. And so if you put up some solar panels, you can collect the starlight from this giant fusion reactor called a star and power whatever it is you're doing up in space. But there's a consequence to collecting all that energy, which is that if you collect energy, at some point you have to get rid of it. Uh, you never destroy energy, you never use it up. So when your computer gets energy from the wall, it does all that interesting stuff, like watching videos on the internet. Uh, and when it's done with the energy, it radiates it away as heat. And that's why your computer warms up when you use it. And that's true of anything. So anything orbiting a star is going to absorb light, and then it's going to be radiated away as heat. And so in 1960, Freeman Dyson had the idea that we should look to see if there are any stars giving off too much heat. Stars are so hot, most of their energy, stars like the sun anyway, or at wavelengths you can see with your eyes. Um, and so the cooler things around them, like planets or dust or big solar panels, uh, would re-radiate, absorb, and then re-radiate that emission away at infrared wavelengths. And so my first project, my first foray into this field, was just sort of pick up that ball that almost no one had worked on since he proposed it. There were a couple of projects, one by Dick Kerrigan at Fermilab, um, and, uh, and see what we could do with the new NASA satellites that had gone up and looked at and measured the infrared emission of basically every star in the sky. So that was my very first, uh, my very first project. Well, and then, yeah, and then since then, uh, I've just been getting involved in more and more uh, angles, more and more ways that we can go about looking for technological signals. Mm -hmm. um, and one of the things we've done is developed a graduate course here, because I realized there's no textbook. I can't go to the library and get a book on all the ways to do this. Uh, so I developed a graduate course that we teach as part of our astrobiology dual title degree here at Penn State University. So this can be taken by astronomers or biologists or geophysicists, anyone who's going to be an astrobiologist. 
um, as part of their astrobiology PhD. And we learned about the history of SETI. We learned about all the ways to do it. We went down to Green Bank and conducted our own radio observations around planet-bearing stars discovered by Kepler. We learned about looking at waste heat. We learned about lasers. Uh, we learned about looking in the solar system for potential artifacts and all the things that can be done. And the students were amazing. We've already had, uh, we've already had one paper published based on a final project the students did. And uh, we have one more submitted to a journal and we have one more ready to submit. So it's, it was a real big success. I look forward to teaching it again next year. Oh, that's awesome. I wish I could go back to grad school and take that course. <laughs> um, I do have to jump over to our questions from the audience now as much as I'd like to keep chatting about that. Um, so let's jump into our audience questions from the hashtag AskAstroBio on Twitter, as well as SaganNet and Facebook. Our first question comes from Twitter from Marianne Denton. Uh, she asks, in addition to active research, you've had uh, many students. Uh, and she says that grad students might struggle with research and with advisors and mentorship. Uh, so what are your expectations of your graduate students uh, and of yourself as an advisor, uh, and how do you support them um, to become independent researchers themselves? Yeah, mentorship for me is an important part of being an advisor. I really appreciate all of the advisors I had through my schooling, my undergraduate advisor, Dan Clemens at Boston University, um, all the way through my PhD work and postdoctoral work, um, all my all my advisors were really strong mentors. Um, they um, they did more than just give me good projects and give me advice. Um, they uh, they're friends and they they cared about my career development. And so I try to I try to do that with all of my students to really support their career aspirations, whatever those are. And um, and provide as much support for their 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 studies and professional development um, that I can. Uh, and then in terms of independence, um, I mean, most of most students want to go on to become independent researchers, and so that's a matter of um, uh, believing in their abilities to do those things and giving them aspirational goals uh, and having high expectations, but also making sure that they understand that. I um, I know they can reach them, and that I'll give them the support they need to do that. And so, it's it's always wonderful to watch the arc of a student go from you know needing a lot of handholding and not being sure what they're doing, to becoming you know much more of an expert in their field uh, than I am, and having their own ideas, and then heading off to go do postdoc do postdoctoral work without any uh, any more support from me. So. Um, uh, yeah, I like to foster that independence and uh, and think of it as a mentorship. That's great. Yeah, it's, it's good to see, you know, the people are actually really invested in, in helping their students, you know, become their own people, their own scientists, um, and learn for themselves how to do these things. Mm -hmm. um, our next question is actually a combo question, which we've never had before. Um, but these two users asked the question that were almost exactly the same, so we put them together. Okay. Uh, so from Dr. Jim Pass on Twitter and from Bruno Pavlitic on SeganNet, uh, the question is, what is the status of the search for potentially habitable exomoons? Uh, have you discovered any? Uh, and is there any emphasis yet um, on, doing, on finding exomoons, or do we need better telescopes that are really made for finding exomoons? Yeah. So it's interesting. Uh, the first habitable zone planets were discovered kind of early on in the planet search. The first time that we found giant planets orbiting stars at sort of one astronomical unit, the typical Earth-Sun distance, um, was just in the first few years of exoplanet discovery. And those first like 20 or 30 or 40 planets, I don't remember which one the first one was. And these are giant planets. They're far enough from their star they could have moons. And all the giant planets, you know, Jupiter and Saturn, they both, they both have lots and lots of moons. So presumably those planets do too. So in some sense, the first exomoons we know, you know, we knew where they were decades ago. Um, now, actually finding those moons and knowing they're there is a much, much harder problem. Today, we still do not have a confirmed detection of a moon around an exoplanet. We have these young exoplanets with gigantic ring systems. Uh, Matt Kenworthy and Eric Mamajek found one of those systems, and there's probably many more. Um, and there is a tentative detection of a large exomoon by David Kipping's team at Columbia University uh, using Kepler and now the Hubble Space Telescope to try and, and verify that it's there. And it's, it looks pretty good, but even there, they're not ready to say we found a moon, but that would not be a habitable exomoon. That would be a very hot one. 
Um, the prospects for finding an exomoon in the habitable zone of a star are much harder because they're just, it's hard enough to find planets. To find a tiny little moon next to them is extremely difficult. So there are some prospects that we might find moon forming disks around very young planets. I'm hopeful that, that we'll be able to do that soon. Uh, and there's prospects that with tests uh, and follow up instruments we can find. Uh, very hot exomoons around close-in planets. But I don't think the, you know, the Endor is going to be something that we find in the very near future. It's just, it's too challenging. Okay, yeah, that's good to know. I mean, our, our planet has a fairly large moon uh, compared to the size of our planet. And it's in the habitable zone. <laughs> exactly. Uh, do, do you think there are potentially Earth-like worlds out there that have even much larger moons? Yeah, um, binary planets. Yeah, and again, size limit? it'll be very hard to tell that you've got a binary planet. Uh, because we are not, it, we're a long way from resolving, seeing a dot of light and saying that's a that's a rocky planet, and oh look, there's a little dot next to it. The the resolution you need from your telescopes to accomplish that is not something that's in the you know in the planning right now that we'll be able to do soon. And actually, people worry a lot about binary planets as false positives for biosignatures. So I mentioned before, one potential biosignature would be seeing oxygen and methane in the atmosphere of a single planet. And while you can do that without life, it, the most natural explanation is that you have an oxygen atmosphere and the life is producing the methane or the other way around. Um, but imagine if the moon had a methane atmosphere. So you've got Earth with its oxygen and the moon with its methane. And when you look at this system from another star, you don't know it's two objects and you see oxygen and methane and you'd get it wrong. You'd think there was a lot of methane and oxygen in the same atmosphere and it was really different. So we worry about binary planets as a, as a false positive, unfortunately. Yeah, that's a great point. Yeah, they, they could be like a, the, the, the worst way for us to start thinking we found life is by finding lots and lots of really awesome planetary systems that are showing us <laughs> something entirely different than what we think. It's um, going to be a, a long road to plow. Yeah. Well, talking about methane in an atmosphere and about moons altogether, uh, our next question comes from Space Nerd on Twitter. Uh, they want to know, uh, what's the place that you would most want to explore for existing or former life in our solar system? Um, so like Mars, Enceladus, Europa, yeah. um, where outside of Earth do you think is the best place to look? I guess that depends on, on whether you're looking for life that's, that's still around. So no, I think it's even money on whether we'll first discover extraterrestrial life in the solar system or, or elsewhere. Um, of course, it depends on whether it exists elsewhere in the solar system, whether it exists elsewhere around the nearby stars we study. Um, but it's also, we can look a lot harder in the solar system than we can around other stars. Um, so Mars looks pretty dead right now. There's not a ton of evidence for biology, although there are these cool, uh, these cool methane detections that are really tantalizing. Um, and so Mars is probably the best bet on both counts. That it, it, We know it was wet. If life is easy to form, then there's probably some kind of evidence of life back when it was wet. Uh, but we might have to dig to find that. Uh, it's not obvious how we'll find that. Um, now, life likes to hang on, and subterranean life in Mars, maybe it's been able to hang on for billions of years since it was wet, uh, in which case, you know, we might even find living life right there on Mars. Um, in terms of other spots, I think Enceladus and Europa still feel, still feel like the best bets because we know that they've got at least slush, if not water. Uh, that we can explore. And Enceladus, it's far away all the way at Saturn. It's hard to get to. But man, it's just spewing that water out into space in those geysers, which means you don't have to land and drill. You don't have to have like this submarine to go down and explore. You can actually sample the seawater in principle uh, and see, see what's in there. So depending on how likely you think it is that a planet like uh, Enceladus would have life in the first place, that might be the best bet. So I don't know. I... I try not to have really strong personal priors on these things because I have no way of knowing which the best one is. And so I try to be kind of flat on all that and say, you know, which is easiest to explore? If Mars is easiest because it's closest, we should do that. If Enceladus is easiest because we fly by it, let's do that. Let's, let, let's try lots of options uh, and not put all our eggs in one basket. It sounds like a good ROI kind of plan <laughs> to get a lot of return because, you know, it is hard to get things funded through NASA. Um, you know, we have a mission going back to Europa soon with Europa Clipper, uh, but no plans in the works to go back to Enceladus. So, um, well, that might change fast. I mean, NASA is a big beast. It takes a long time to to sort of turn that train, uh, turn that ship. 
But uh, the discovery of those plumes has created lots and lots of discussion. Mm -hmm. uh, and so it wouldn't surprise me if, if things go there. And I know that the Break Starshot people have been talking about a quick trip to go visit uh, Enceladus if they can figure out how to get that gigantic laser working. <laughs> That'd be kind of nice. Yeah, I got there really quick and take a little sample. Exactly. Um, let's ask another question here. Uh, Melly Howard on Facebook asks, uh, as a student who's looking to go into astrobiology, uh, what kinds of majors or minors or even courses uh, should they look for? Um, and is a master's enough or do you really need a doctorate uh, to become an astrobiologist? Mm, yeah. So there's a lot of entries into astrobiology. So here at Penn State, I was mentioning we have a PhD program and you can come into astrobiology from biology. We have a lot of people that come through in the earth sciences uh, or you can come through in astronomy. Um, so, I mean, it's a broad field. And when you're doing your undergraduate work, you should pick, you know, what your entry into it is. And that doesn't limit you. You can still go learn the other stuff, especially in graduate school. Um, but you really want to excel at something at the undergraduate level so that you can have a really strong start to your graduate career. So if you wanted to go into astronomy, which is the one I can advise best, um, then uh, you want to have a really good physics background and mathematics. Um, when we admit people to our program, uh, it, we can teach astronomy. We can teach quickly, get you up to speed on magnitudes and how telescopes work and stuff. Um, but it's it's hard to get people up to speed on mathematical physics and stuff if you don't have a strong background on it. So that's what I would recommend for that angle. And then if you wanted to come in from uh, the biology or earth sciences, then you would want to major in something like geophysics or microbiology or something like that. Uh, to get in on that angle. So um, uh, depending on where your interests lie, you should contact a faculty member at an astrobiology program like ours at Penn State or the folks at University of Washington, for instance, uh, and ask them what prep would be um, looked upon most favorably in their department for, for graduate studies. Awesome. Uh, oh, and, and I would say a PhD is what you're after. Most, most you know, uh, scientists in all of those disciplines are PhD scientists. Yeah. And if I can be a little selfish, I also mentioned University of Colorado in Boulder, where uh, we're in. Well, I'm in Boulder right now. Uh, that's where I got my PhD from, and it's also a dual certificate in astrobiology at CU Boulder as well. Great. All right. So, uh, you there are other schools that are offering um, some of these dual degrees. Um, I'm not sure if we actually have any degrees in astrobiology um, offered currently, uh, but maybe in the future. Um, but yeah. So uh, let's move to another question. This one's from Preetha Jaipal on SeganNet. Uh, Preetha asks, uh, supposing if there is a possibility for silicon-based life in the universe, uh, does it then still make sense to look for Earth-like conditions in exoplanets? Right. So this gets back to the issue of, you know, you know why limit ourselves to Earth-like planets? And the best, the two best reasons are we know it works in Earth-like environments because it worked here and it was robust here. Uh, and we have to look somewhere. So the farther afield of those conditions we get, for instance, silicon-based life, um, the, the less sure our footing is. And, and again, I try not to have strong personal priors. I think it's a great idea to look for those unexpected kinds of life or um, those more unusual but expected kinds of life, like silicon-based life. But um, it, it's hard to define a program to look for life as we don't know it, because the don't know it part means we don't know exactly what we're looking for. Um, so uh, fortunately, you know, the, 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 the planets we're looking for that are most like the Earth are some of the hardest to find. And the stepping stones to finding those planets and studying them are to find planets that are a little hotter and a little more massive and around the wrong kind of star and a little younger. Uh, and so those will necessarily be the planets that we're looking at first on our way to that, you know, holy grail of Earth 2.0 or something like that. So um, I'm not too concerned that we will neglect the other kinds of planets. We will necessarily be looking at the planets where we can learn the most first. Oh, very cool. Um, let's bring up, we only have about 10 minutes left, so we have just a few more questions yet. We have some time from our audience. Uh, user Brian Collins on Facebook has asked, uh, if there is a plan in place uh, for what we do if we find an extraterrestrial species that's more advanced uh, than just a microbe, say. Is there a plan? So this yeah. is called post-detection protocol. Uh, 
So what do you do when SETI succeeds and you get that signal from outer space that means we're not alone as a technological species in the galaxy or in the universe? And yeah, there's been a lot of thought of this on this. Um, I mean, the pioneers of this program, of the SETI programs, like Frank Drake and, and Jill Tarter, um, have, uh, have always thought about, you know, what is that protocol? The first protocol is you confirm it. You don't want to be wrong. And, uh, and so the first thing you do is you make sure other telescopes see the same signal. Everyone agrees where it is. Everyone agrees on its strength and its frequencies and, and what's in there. And then what follows after that depends a lot on what you found. Uh, if what you found is some sort of simple communicative signal that, you know, you know what it's saying, like in Carl Sagan's uh, contact or something like that, um, you know, things are going to move really fast. And, and uh, but if what you find is kind of ambiguous or, you know, you can tell it's a transmission, but it's not for us and we don't know how to decode it and things like that, then the implications maybe aren't so strong. If what we're finding is a star on the other side of the galaxy, well, you know, there's not really any opportunity for a back and forth in that case. So the consequences aren't as strong as if it's the next star over where, you know, they probably know we're here. And if we send a signal now, we'll get an answer in our lifetimes. Um, I've been convinced by uh, anthropologists that study this stuff, like Catherine Denning at, uh, at York, um, that, uh, that we're not really prepared to handle this properly, to communicate a discovery to the public uh, in a way that that, that the, the world public uh, will will appreciate what we do know and what we don't know. There's a lot of preconceived notions people have about what kind of life is out there and what it means to have contacted them. And so this is something where I think we need to do more work uh, to be ready for what we find. But I also think like, you know, all the best plans, as soon as they meet contact with reality, We'll go, oh, well, this isn't what we planned for. This is not what we thought we would see. I think we're going to be surprised. Uh, but hopefully it will be a sufficiently ambiguous signal that we'll have some time to figure it out. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, not, it's not E.T. coming to say hi with gigantic military warships or anything like that. Right. Um, yeah. Okay, that, that, that's really intriguing. Um, it's a little scary to think that we wouldn't have a plan in place uh, necessarily. I mean, there's um, plans for like who you talk to, right? The first thing yeah. you have to you have to you know communicate with other astronomers. Do you see this as well? You get the confirmation. Yeah. You know, you do all of this stuff, and then you make an announcement about what it is you found. So, I mean, that that protocol is set up, um, but that's just that's just how do the astronomers make sure they haven't made a mistake, and how do they do the press conference and stuff? Yeah, but then after that, who knows, right? <laughs> yeah, I mean, can we answer? It's going to depend so much on what it is we think we found. Yeah, the truth is always stranger than the fiction. Um, let's end with more technical question from user Tom Caruso on Facebook. Um, first off, he said congrats on your award. Thank you. Uh, and then secondly, he says, uh, can you elaborate on how we start to sort out uh, the different molecules that we find in the atmospheres of exoplanets? Um, so, so, for instance, yeah. how can our observations let us see uh, ocean versus land versus atmosphere. Can we see circulation in an atmosphere? Um, and you know, it, could we actually tell that there are signs of life in an atmosphere by looking right. at it? Right. It depends a lot on how it is we're measuring the planet. So the 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 methods that seem the most ripe, the ones that are going to happen first, are when the James Webb Space Telescope launches. It will be able to analyze, as I discussed, the the starlight filtering through a planetary atmosphere in transmission. And so we'll be able to learn about that atmosphere. Uh, clouds will make things hard to measure and, and uh, it'll be, it'll be very challenging, but we'll be able to immediately recognize certain chemical species like hydrogen or, you know, carbon monoxide, carbon dioxide and things like that. And hopefully methane, there will be a challenge of interpretation too. Um, we know what the chemical fingerprints of all these gases look like, but we're going to be seeing them all piled on top of each other, which is going to make disentangling everything kind of challenging. Uh, and so um, we'll find something with the James Webb Space Telescope. It's possible it'll be a whoppingly large signal and surprise us, and we'll just know. I think it's more likely it's going to be kind of ambiguous. Uh, it's good, and, and there aren't very many planets we know of. Hopefully we'll find some more soon that we'll be able to do this work on. Um, but the bottom line answer is that we'll see uh, the missing patterns of light that are characteristic of those um, of those chemical species in the atmosphere, and that's how we'll know what the atmosphere is made of. Now, if we detect a planet in reflected light, 
so use a coronagraph on some future mission and actually image that little ball of rock that is a planet reflecting its starlight, that's a little bit different. Uh, we'd be looking in reflected light and we'd be other, able to study other things about the planet as it rotated. So if you just think about looking at a globe of the Earth, sometimes you're looking at the Pacific Ocean, sometimes you're looking at, you know, Siberia, sometimes you're seeing a lot of clouds, and sometimes it's pretty clear on that hemisphere. And as the planet rotates, these things all change. And so by monitoring those changes, we'll learn things like how quickly the planet rotates, and we might be able to infer things like, you know, how much of it is covered in, in oceans and whether it has clouds, and then we'll take spectra in that reflected light, and similar to the atmospheric thing, we can hopefully figure out what the what the atmospheric constituents are. That's awesome. Uh, unfortunately, we only have a few minutes left, uh, so I think we're actually going to end uh, with just asking you, Dr. Wright, if you have some final words of wisdom for up and coming astrobiologists. Oh, for up and coming astrobiologists. Um, well, uh, for me, I've I've followed problems that I find really interesting, like um, work on things that inspire you. Um, I've occasionally signed on to projects that didn't really inspire me, that I, I, I wasn't really motivated on, and I've always regretted it. Um, you should, you should uh, stick to what, you, what, what gets you up out of bed, and you're like, wow, I really want to work on this problem. Things you, you get animated when people ask you about it. You're like, yes, let me tell you what I'm working on. That's a good indicator of what you should, what you should chase down. And then, you know, a lot of this work is a slog like working through Jackson homework problems in E&M or, you know, debugging that piece of code that you've just been working on for weeks that never seems to work. There is a slog uh, that you have to get through, but the reward at the other end is nice because you get to talk about your great discoveries. No, that's wonderful. Well, thank you so much for your time, Dr. Jason Wright. Uh, thank you everyone for watching Ask an Astrobiologist for this month's episode. Uh, we look forward to seeing you all again. Uh, and until then, stay curious. Mm -hmm.